company to pray. Um, I can see you always clear as a bell, my glasses on. Uh, my eyes were, I got something going on in my left. I wanted to have my doctor look at it, I think. But So I kept my contacts out the last few days to kind of let it clear back up. So I can see this. But I'm going to be looking like this to read a little bit. And, but I look at you, I can see you, you're beautiful right now. But like this, there's, there's I man, the crowd multiplied. Wow, look at that. How did that happen? Woo! Like the 12 loaves of bread. We just multiplied. You got your Bibles turned to Matthew chapter 12 tonight. Matthew chapter 12. It is good to be here. Good to see you. Thankful to be able to come and worship the Lord tonight. It's a cold night outside. Uh, cold this past weekend, going to be cold tonight, warm up a little bit we hope, but uh, we're glad to be able to worship in a warm place tonight. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to pick up at verse 15, if you will please stand with me and honor the word of God. Matthew 12, verse number 15. <clears throat> Matthew 12, verse 15. Jesus was aware of this and withdrew. Now just to remind you what we're talking about here, he'd been in the synagogue uh, there in this town he was at, uh, and he healed a man who had a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees were plotting to kill him. So Jesus was aware of this and withdrew from there. Well, large crowds followed him, and he healed them all. He warned them not to make him known, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not argue or shout and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed and he will not put out a smoldering wick until he has led justice to victory. The nations will put their hope in his name. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. All the crowds were astounded and said, Could this be the son of David? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will this, his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? The Jewish exorcists, that's who he's talking about there. For this reason they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come near upon you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask now to bless your word. We ask you to put your words in our mouth uh, to give to your people. Anoint this place as you already have. Anoint us uh, to proclaim your gospel, to proclaim your joy. Uh, to proclaim your love and strength and care and concern for us. God, help us to be united with you, uh, to be in one mind and one accord with one another, to press on uh, for the gospel work. We love you and praise you, and we ask all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. May God bless his word tonight. Tonight we will look at uh, unity displays God's power while division leads to destruction. Unity displays God's power, but division leads to destruction. Now I know Jesus has already told us he, he came to divide uh, father against son, mother against daughter-in-law, all these things. That's not the kind of division we're talking about tonight. Jesus was talking about division. He was coming to draw those who were his to salvation, and those who were not going to believe were going to be divided from those. Just like in the last days, he sends out his angels to gather those who are born again unto him, those who are not left behind. That's what that division Jesus was talking about here. Here we look at, though, division is the dividing of like our congregation. We're divided into three groups tonight, and the way you see it, and the way you seat, or sit, or where you're seated, but we're not divided spiritually. This group loves that group. 
And that group loves this group. And this group loves everybody, right? Did you all catch the play on words, right? Uh, so I hope you did. We love one another. I hope we do. We better. That's what we're called to do is to love one another. After leaving this place where he had learned of this plot where he was at, he moves on to somewhere else. And we see Jesus, as he goes, he heals everyone who comes to him. Doesn't turn anybody away. He heals them. He is displaying this, and Matthew's very meticulous in pointing this out. He is displaying his unity, his oneness with the Father by fulfilling prophecy, by fulfilling God's Word. Now, but we also look at this passage, and we see where division, how it leads to destruction. A kingdom, a house, a family, a city, a state, a church cannot be divided against itself. If it divides itself against something, over something, it's going to break. It's going to be destroyed at some point in time. It's going to fall apart. No matter who's right or who's wrong, it does not matter. We cannot be divided in the work of God. We see, though, in the unity, as, in the unity aspect of this, Jesus fulfilled prophecy to display his unity with the Father. And again, I mentioned Matthew takes great care. If you read Matthew's entire gospel, you see him numerous times pull out passages of Scripture of the Old Testament where Jesus is fulfilling what God said the Messiah would do. And that's key. These prophecies relate to the Messiah, the Son of God, who we know as Jesus, whom the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, are still looking for to come now. They're still looking for the Messiah to come. Well, he's already come. He's already been here. He's been here. He died for the sins of all humanity and rose from the dead in payment and victory over sin, death, and hell, and the grave. We look at him. these large crowds followed him, and he healed them all. He warned them not to make him known. He warned them not to make him known. Now, it, it, if you're trying to gather a following, you want to be known. You want your name out there. If you, you, we've seen enough politicians come around. We've seen enough social media people come around. We've seen enough whoever, whatever you want to talk about. A new product, whatever it is. You want a following. You want people to get the word out about who you are, what you're doing, or what you've got. You want the extra clicks, you want the extra likes, you want the extra heart, whatever it is. You want those extra moments of somebody, well, this person's got this, you need to see them. Jesus tells those who came after him to be healed, don't make me known. Don't go off and tell everybody who I am, where I am, and what's going on here. Now, we wonder about this. We wonder about this if you don't, if Matthew just left the next part out. We would be, okay, why didn't he want to make himself known? Well, we could rationalize he didn't want to make himself known because extra large crowds would get there and he would draw more attention to himself and he'd be unable to preach. All he'd be doing was healing all the time. That's one way to look at it. And it's partially what it is. But the main point that Matthew says here, by the Spirit of God's direction, just looking at what Jesus did, he adds in verse 17, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. That's from Isaiah chapter 42. The first few verses there. We see Jesus didn't seek a name for himself in his first advent. He didn't come seeking to lift his name up to proclaim his name everywhere and to build up a huge, huge following while he was here. He came to touch lives. He came, though, to display his unity with the Father, his oneness with the Father. Not just unity, but his oneness. This morning, if you were in Sunday school, and we kind of went over it in our cabin this morning with the youth, we talked about the Shema, which means listen. Listen. <laughs> The Lord, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He's one God. Jesus is God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Three parts, 
but one God. Jesus displays his oneness with the Father here by fulfilling what God said his servant would do. When Isaiah wrote that, when Isaiah received that message from God, here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. Isaiah is not speaking about himself. He's not. In other passages of Scripture, where the Ethiopian eunuch is, is reading, where the suffering service displayed, the guy asked Philip, who is Isaiah speaking about, himself or somebody else? Isaiah was speaking about the Messiah. This, Isaiah 42, is a messianic prophecy. Now, you just look at it. As Matthew records it here, I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Hey, that's great, right? And Jesus came. Jesus, God, the, he loves justice. He loves justice. He didn't like dishonest scales. He didn't like that. He didn't like for you to treat somebody one way and somebody else another. He loves justice. He says he will not argue or shout and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. Have you, ever, have you ever had something, I haven't put a garden out in a while, but have you ever had something break a corn stalk and you walk by and you see it broke and you just kind of prop it back up, hope it makes it, you know, what's happened? It's broke. <laughs> Most likely it's not going to do nothing else, right? We, get the, we got a gladiolia plant and that's, it's, it's survived, it is survived and survived and survived. And it comes up, and that thing blooms. I mean, it's just beautiful when it blooms. But it gets so heavy, it does what? And you just kind of prop it up. Uh, what's, that, what's that bush in the front yard, Brandon? The... Yeah, you, all, you old folks know it as pineys. Uh, my mom calls it a pine, it's a peony, okay? Uh, I don't know where in the world she got. Some of you know it as peonies, but she knows it pineys. And I don't, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, when I met Brandy, peony, really? That's what it means? Yeah, she had to educate me on that, you see? And, uh, but this peony, big old, I mean, the thing is, is fat. I, I almost like to eat that thing sometimes. It looks so good, you know? Just like, ants love it. I mean, there's all kinds of ants on it and everything. But it gets so heavy, it falls over. You stand it up, we've got tomato cages around it to hold it up. Jesus, it says, he will not break a bruised reed. If you got something that's bruised, it means it's, it's ready to fall over. Jesus in his meekness, in his humbleness, in his gracefulness. Isaiah, Matthew gives the analogy that Jesus' touch would not even break that. People who are lost in the woods, oftentimes those who are trying to find them, the best thing to do is stop moving and stay there. If they know the general direction you've gone, they can possibly find the trail you've left behind. By the sticks you've broken, the branches you've moved, uh, the indentions in the soil that you've left behind. Jesus says he will not brew, break a bruised reed. He will not put a, out a smoldering wick. You ever seen a candle on its last legs? You don't even need to blow on it. You just kind of walk by and it goes out. Jesus in his meekness, his humbleness, his gentleness. The analogy is he would walk by it and not blow it out. What does all that mean for us? Jesus was not seeking to proclaim and lift up his name while he was here on the earth the first time. He came to do the will of the Father. And in the aspect of that, he had to humble himself. He had to leave all his glory behind in heaven, even though God glorified him here. He did. But he left all his majesty, his glory. Uh, Peter, James, and John got just a taste of that glory there on the Mount of Transfiguration. They, they got a taste of it there, but for the most part, Jesus left it all in heaven. Left it there to humble himself, not to draw a huge following because we know what happens when a big group of people get together for the wrong reason. These people came to Jesus to be healed, and he healed them all. When he feeds the 5,000, they keep following him. Why? To be fed. 
Not necessarily to hear him teach. Some were following to hear him teach. That's the great, that's the ones that were in the right frame of mind to hear him teach. But others just came, well, let's see another miracle. What's he going to do today? I mean, who brought lunch today that can give it to him, right? What's he going to feed us today? We got brand fish yesterday. Maybe we get something better today. Jesus came to display his unity with the Father by fulfilling the messianic prophecies. Notice verse 21 tells you that this prophecy was only partially fulfilled. It's not completely fulfilled yet. Look at verse 21. The nations will put their hope in his name. Has that happened? Everybody say, no. America has not put its hope in Jesus. England has not put its hope in Jesus. China, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, any nation you name, they have not put their hope in Jesus. There are people within each of those nations that have put their hope in Jesus. And I know our Pledge of Allegiance is one nation under God. <laughs> this nation is not under God. It is not under God at all. We are not the elect as a nation, but I as a believer in Jesus Christ am part of the elect. I am part of the family, the nation, the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ because he fulfilled all of the messianic prophecies. The ones that are still being fulfilled, he's doing that. The ones that are still yet to be fulfilled, he's not forgotten them. He'll finish those too when he comes back, you see? He displays his oneness with the Father. Then Jesus goes on, the demon possessed man is brought to him, blind and unable to speak. I mean, that's, what kind of life is that? This demon has bound this man up. He could hear, though. He could hear. He was blind and unable to speak. He could hear, though. I wonder the competing voices this man heard. He's possessed by a demon. You just imagine what he's hearing. Imagine. Uh, imagine the, the Gadarean demonic who they tried to chain him up and, and the demon was so strong in him, the legion of demons were so strong in him, he'd just break the chains like Samson would break chains. Imagine what he was hearing, though. This man could not speak. He could not tell it audibly to stop speaking to him. He could not cry out to help for help from anybody. He was unable to speak. And he was blind. He couldn't see where to go for help until somebody... Somebody knew Jesus was healing people. And someone believed that Jesus could heal this person. And they brought his, this demon-possessed man to Jesus. He healed him. You just, just, I don't, if you write in your Bibles, if you write in your Bibles, you just underline those three words. Underline them. He healed him. Do you see the magnitude of that? That's three little words. Matthew, just, just throw it in there. By, by accident, he healed him. When you came to Jesus, what did he do? He healed you. Do you see? He healed you. So that the man could both speak and see. Just love it. Just love it. All the crowds were astounded and said, Could this be the son of David? What is that title? It's Messianic in nature. Son of David, Messianic in nature. Huh, the Pharisees. This has got to stop. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Notice it says, Matthew said they said it. The next verse is knowing their thoughts, Jesus told them. Knowing their thoughts. This man, this man is not of God. He's only able to cast out these demons by the Beelzebub, above the rule of the demons. They're, they're really stretching, aren't they? Do you see how far some people will go to resist the power of God? 
Do you see what we as God's people are up against? When it comes to evangelizing this world, people are going to find excuses. They're going to find reasons. They're going to find whatever they can. Some are. To resist the drawing power of God. God can overcome that though. God does it for some of these Pharisees and he does it really to the greatest Pharisee of all, the Apostle Paul. He draws him out of that sinful life. He draws him out of that works-based salvation into faith. And he can do that for you too. He can. He can do this for anybody. Jesus eloquently, I just love this. He, well, the Pharisees, let me remind you of this. They were misguided, they were envious, and they were jealous. Because none of the Pharisees were casting out demons. They had a group of people called, they were Jewish exorcists. And don't, please don't go watch that movie. Uh, don't, don't read up on that stuff. You're just going to get all confused and, and open doors for Satan. Just, if you're going to read something, read the Word of God. Okay, read that. Read that. These Jewish exorcists would go out and they perform, I don't, and God somehow, sometimes evidently, God allowed them to cast out demons, evidently. The Pharisees are not mentioned doing it, though. And there's no mention of any Pharisee healing anybody either. What I do find, though, is after Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astounded because... This man, Jesus, was teaching them with authority, unlike the scribes. And you can add in there the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had no authority because they were not of God. They thought they were, but they were not. Every kingdom, he says, divided against itself. This is so eloquent. Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. I, I, I think I was with I was with Brandy. We were I don't know where we were at very recently, and we were just reminding ourselves that of how divided our nation is over so many issues. So many issues. I mean, we can't disagree over anything anymore without cons being considered hateful and 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 intolerant or whatever. And it's just the way it is. We've only been a nation for little over 200 something years I mean Rome was at Rome was a whole was around a whole lot longer than us look what happened to it Babylon look what happened to it Assyria look what happened to it Greece well Greece is still a country today Paul yes it is but it's nowhere like it was back in in this day Egypt same way it greatest greatest nation on the earth at one point in time it nowhere near like it used to be all these nations have come and gone because, in essence, they were divided against themselves. They were divided against themselves because this group wanted this, this group wanted that, this group wanted this, this group wanted that. And they went their separate ways because they could not get along. Folks, this is where our nation's headed. It's where it's headed for destruction, for division. A city, a house, which means a family, against itself, divided against itself, will not stand. You cannot stand if you're divided against itself. Cannot. If your family's divided over whatever issue, it's not going to stand. Let me, let me remind you, the holidays are here, and I know some of you, you cringe when it's time to go to holiday. I know, it's, I know you cringe. Because of what you're going to be faced because you live in a divided family. Maybe not necessarily your family itself, but where you have to go. Somebody's going to say something and they've, they've waited a full year to say it to somebody else in the family. You can't stop that. You can't stop that because some people are just cold hearted. They are. Let me remind you. That family is not going to stand. If that's, if that's the only aspect that family is going, it's not going to stand. And I'm not going to tell you to be on the right side when it falls. Because in essence, there is no right side. There's not. There's not a right side. There's a lot of wrong sides. There's no right side. 
The only side we can stand on is the kingdom of God. The only side we can stand on is Jesus' side and in his word. When these two competing groups want to argue over what, I don't care what it is. Politics, sports, whatever's been, I don't, it doesn't matter. What can we do as God's people is not participate in the argument. Not participate in the argument. When, when I know, Paul, you're going to say, I get pulled into it. Trust me, I've been there. You get pulled into it. Here's where you take your family back to. Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. You take your family right back there. And when asked, where did you get that from? I got it from the word of God. Well, who told you to tell me to say that? Jesus did. Are you really sure? Yeah, my pastor told me to. You put, I don't care. You come out, let them come after me. I'll tell them where they stand. They need to stand with Jesus. Not on whatever belief they have. Jesus is the only thing that we can stand on. He's the only foundation we can build our lives on. I know you've got them. I know you've got them. I've seen them. They're cold-hearted. They're conniving. Jesus can break that heart. But they've got to get off the foundation of sinking sand of their own and get on the foundation of Jesus. Because right now, they're headed for destruction, and they're going to take their family with it. Division. Kingdoms, cities, houses, families being divided. That's Satan's goal. Being destroyed, that's Satan's goal. Why do you think Satan is so after the family unit in our nation today? It's after it. You know, I, I, I was so infuriated the other day, so infuriated. The World Cup started today. Uh, in, in the nation that's in, it, it, they're, uh, uh, they're, they have issues. They do. They have issues. But what infuriated me even more is the United States men's national team is in it, this, this tournament. And they go in there and they, they're able to decorate their locker room how they want to. And they have the red, white, blue uh, displayed there with the, with the whatever decal they, they use there. Right above that, right above that, there's rainbows, rainbow colors all over this thing. In that nation that this World Cup's at, they slaughter gay people. If they find you gay, they find you as a gay person, they slaughter you. Here we as a nation show up and we, we take our allotted space and we decorate it, thumbing our nose at them and tell them, hey, look at you. We'll do what we want to do. We are so arrogant. We are so prideful in our sin. We are living Romans 1 where people look at it and there are people clapping. You go, America. You go, America. You go, America. As a fan of soccer, I want them to win. But as a Christian, I want them to be kicked out of that nation tomorrow. I do. Because they're arrogant, they're prideful, and they're so far from Jesus. And that's not some of the players. It's not some of them. But it's his people in charge of things. They just think, we're, we're above anything. We're above everybody else. That's, they're Pharisees, man. That's what they are. They're Pharisees. And they have divided our nation, and they're leading it right to destruction. There's the division part. There's the, the unity. There's the division. Now here's the hope. Here's the hope. Jesus goes on to say, if Satan drives out Satan, he's dividing against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Well, it won't. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? See, he put them on the spot. Don't you just love Jesus when he does that? He, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he takes their question, he takes their statement and asks them the question. Okay, hey, you guys. You Pharisees, you've got sons, which means other Israelites, that are exorcists, and they're casting out demons. Well, by what power do they cast out demons? It's like when Jesus would later ask him a question John, about John the Baptist. Was his message from God or not? 
and, and they, they, they got in a, uh, that holy huddle, they call it. And let's figure this out, guys. Okay, if we say it's of God, the crowd's going to tell us, then why didn't you believe? If, they, if we say John the Baptist's message was a man, that we're afraid the people will stone us because the people believed John was a prophet, and he was. And so they come back to Jesus, we don't know who, where his authority and his message came from. Well, then, oh, well, I ain't going to tell you where my authority comes either. ha ah, ah. ha Walk on. They were too afraid to answer a simple question because it would put them on the spot of having to admit that John the Baptist was sent by God to proclaim the Messiah was coming and had come in Jesus. They didn't want to take that road because they were afraid of where it might lead to. For this reason, they will be your judges. You're, you've got people in your, in your own groups. You're... you're, you're your religious Israelites are casting out demons by whose power they cast them out. They're your judges. But then, Jesus, here's the main part. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God had come. Jesus' healing power came from God and his place as God's son. God allowed Jesus to display his power of healing. God allowed that. Remember, Jesus came to do the will of the Father, not his own. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. He came to do the will of the Father. His power over the demons demonstrated that the kingdom of God had indeed come upon the earth. This wasn't some exorcist, some sideshow. This was the Son of God displaying God's power on the earth. Jesus says, How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. <laughs> and you may read that. That makes, that makes a whole... That's like a proverb in the Old Testament, right? It makes a lot of sense. If, if, if I'm going to go rob Chad Nicky's house, which I'm not going to... Um, I got, I, got, I, got, I got to tie up four people because even Nicky could beat me up. You know what I'm saying? But it makes common sense, right? That's why most times your house is robbed and you're not there. So don't tell people when you're gone. Word of wisdom. There's another proverb. You don't find it in the Old Testament. You'll find it in, in our life, right? Huh. But it makes sense, though. That is not. Who's the, who's the strong man Jesus is talking about? He's talking about Satan. Satan's a strong man here. If I... You got to go way into Revelation, man. <laughs> go into Revelation, if 19. Oh, we all... Oh, no, he's going there. Go, go, go. Go into it and look at it. Jesus comes down and he binds up Satan. Locks him up. I know the scripture reads he gets out again. He's, now, he doesn't escape. He gets let out. Okay? Then he's a lot to begin for eternity. Understand this. Satan, the enemy, the adversary, the deceiver, the liar, has a lot of power. We've seen him come into nations, cities, families, and tear them apart because he loves division. Jesus, on the other hand, brought the kingdom of God down from heaven unto man to make us and to give us the opportunity to be unified with the Father, with the Savior, with the God of the universe, the creator of the universe. God brought the kingdom of God down in the form of Jesus Christ to bring us into his family. Satan will be bound someday, not just for a short time either, but forever. Jesus has never been bound. You can, you can, Paul, what about the crucifixion? Remember, let me tell you this. Let me, this reminds you. Jesus gave up his life. They did not take it from him. He gave up his life in payment for the sins of this world, mine and yours, and then rose from the dead. Jesus will never be bound because Satan will not reign as king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords forever. Not for a short time. 
Not like Caesar, Nero, not like any of the other kings, kings of England, whoever else you want to come up with. Not like those guys. Jesus will reign as king of kings forever. He is bound. He will bind up the strong man. And if you're a believer in Christ, let me remind you of who lives inside of you. Jesus Christ lives inside of you, the one who can bound and bind up your enemy. Where are you going to draw your power from? Him. It's not you that binds up the enemy. It's you that call upon the name of Jesus and have Jesus bind up the enemy for you. When you're united with Jesus, when you're united with him, the kingdom of God is displayed in your life. Unity, oneness with the Father, <laughs> brings about great blessings. I mean, humongous blessings. Division leads to destruction, which is Satan's realm. He wants to divide. He loves to divide. Satan divides, Jesus multiplies. Where do you want? Where do you want to go? The kingdom of God's come near. It's here in Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you. We give you the honor and glory. Take your word now and do what you want to with it, Father. We love you. You're amazing and good. And we just praise your holy name. God, forgive us of our sins. God, bind up our enemy. God, give us the strength to resist temptation. Give us the strength to stand against division. Give us the strength to preach unity in Jesus Christ. Not unity in man. Not unity in movements. But unity in Jesus Christ. Oneness with the Father. God, your son Jesus, he prayed there in the garden that all of us who would believe what the disciples preached what you told them to preach will be one in you. God, help your church to be one in you. We pray if there's anybody here lost, God, speak to them. God, the message this morning, this one tonight, take them out and draw people to salvation, Father. In your son's name we pray, and amen. Let's get a song.